Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Gary Hall from Exodus and formerly from Slayer, and you're listening to The Razor's Edge. So thank you for thank you for joining me um, to chat about the um, the new record that, um, that that has come out. Um, Thanks for the opportunity. Um, so it's called Suffer and Become. It came out on Friday. Um, just really interested to in to hear in your words what people who may not have had the chance to check the record out are going to really are going to get from this album, and a bit of a delve into kind of how you feel has been the biggest growth in the way that the band has progressed um from um from to bay from the throat of cowardice in, into this one with your with um, with your writing and creation of the album yeah um you know we really set out to not release a sequel to the first one i mean vitriol we we've always wanted vitriol to be the kind of band that released um that approach to every album with its own unique goals and identity. Uh, and, and we, with the first album, I did my best to create the most relentless experience I could. Mm-hmm. Um, and with this album, uh, I really wanted to take all of that concentrated energy that type ball that was on the first album and kind of blow it up and re-sculpt all of that energy into higher peaks and, and lower valleys. We we made this album a lot more uh, dynamic. So okay. whereas the uh, first album is more of a chainsaw, this album is uh, feels like a movie. Okay, I get you. Because, I mean, listening to it, um what I got quite early into its run length is there's a lot going on behind the scenes of the music. So you've got the you know you've got the music that's kind of like in front of you, you've got the guitars, the drums, the vocals, but there's a lot behind it and it's a very thick, thick sound. Um, is that kind of where you think maybe the 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 change in the way that you've kind of crafted this album so it's not a complete follow-on has I mean, is that kind of what you were setting out where you've got a really thick sound that's there's a lot going on that you can kind of that you can hear them so the more you listen to it you're picking up on more um instances of the um of, of, the, full, of the full product if that makes sense yeah. yeah absolutely um yeah i felt like with because the thing is I, it, while wanting to make a more dynamic album i also didn't want to lose i was talking about that ball of energy yeah. i didn't want to lose the net overall amount of intensity so mm. since I knew the guitars, um, there's more space in the music on this album. That might be surprising because it doesn't sound that way, but uh, that's what allowed room in the background for me to have a lot of fun with that. Those post-production elements okay. that are, that are more subtle on the record, mm. but uh uh, that's what filled in the gaps to still make it a very dense and layered sound. Okay, cool. With, I mean, with going going back to the previous album, um, with that having such a a really um, basically, it got a lot of attention. I I had an idea of what I was expecting when I heard it because I'd got the previous EP. Um, but even kind of when you expected what you were going to get it, what you were going to get, I was still just blown away by how absolutely just, um, just phenomenal it was. Oh, now, thank you so much. You've obviously got people like me telling you this. When you say you don't want to create a follow up album, was there kind of, I don't know, pressure within the songwriting to make sure that you are hitting, you know, you're getting what people are going to expect, but without having to, um, but obviously while still going through a progression or was there really, were you just trying not to concentrate on things like that and just have fun with it and just do what you wanted to do as a, as a creative force? Yeah, hundred percent. I think a, a really great uh, mantra for any creative person to lean on um, is uh, doing what's best for you is doing what's best for your audience, uh, for your fans. So for me, there's, 
you know, I, I imagine it's it's a conflict that every musician feels within them when they're moving into following up something that people liked, you know, because that's the uh, double edged sword of success. Yeah. Um, you know, but yeah, you just really have to, in my experience, you just have to white knuckle it and not give a shit, do your best to not give a shit and, uh, be willing to, uh, try to make them like something different just as much. Uh, but yeah, I, I, uh, I just really don't see the value in, um, trying to constantly outdo the same thing, you know, and it would be hard to do that. I think that, that the first album is, I love the first album for what it is. And, uh, I don't think I could make a, make a to bathe part two. That was more to bathe than the first one. <laughs> yeah. I get you. I get, I get you. Um, what was the writing process for this album? Did it, I mean, when did you, I mean, cause obviously your, your touring schedule was halted in 2020, um, due to the pandemic. How long did it, when did you decide that now's the time to start putting together ideas or were they constantly flowing throughout, um, you know, th and basically throughout maybe whilst you were out on the road prior to, um, to the pandemic, um, was there a case of, you all got together and were like, okay, let's put together a record. Or was it just something that you gradually were collecting material for and, and tweaking and working on? I was casually banking ideas. Um, you know, there was like a phase with my writing where, you know, if I come up with an idea that I'm really excited about, I don't say no to it. Hmm. But usually when I want to, start a new project after the previous one i like to allow some time for enough life to happen yeah so i can approach the new album or the new project with a fresh perspective um the the pandemic forced my hand there you know uh i was casually letting it come to me and then when the pandemic happened i said fuck okay i guess we're just making an album right now <laughs> so, here we go uh so i didn't feel ready necessarily um i felt pretty uh i, I remember feeling very disheartened that i had to push into the serious working phase on the record that early but uh it was a at the end of the day it it was a good thing because it showed me that I don't necessarily have to be ready to, um, you know, to come out come up with a good result. You just have to put in the work. Okay. Okay. With regard to your writing style, now as a band, your writing style is very, very, it's very aggressive in the way that yeah. you play, but it also comes across vocally as well. Now you get a lot of very intense death metal bands that they're either one or the other. They'll either have extremely intense vocals or extremely intense music. And maybe, the, again, there, there's always going to be some thought. There's, there's always the aggression. There's always the intensity there. But it's very rarely you'll find something that is, you know, on level 10 and matches on both on both sides of the sides of the um, of that coin. What is it about the creative process that you guys put together that hits that result, in your opinion? Yeah, that's, thank you. That's a kind of observation yeah i i mean that's always been the philosophy of for me um really really aggressive let me just say let me put it in that uh frame it in this way growing up i had the fortune i grew up in portland oregon which i still live in uh we had a very thriving music scene so i had the fortune of of coming up rubbing elbows with a lot of different subcultures and a har hardcore was one of my group on a lot of hardcore shows mm -hmm. uh even though it was uh more of a metal fan from from youth uh but i loved the aggression 
you know what I mean? I loved the the rowdiness. I loved the the emotion. Um, but nothing moved me like metal did. Yeah. Uh, and there was something about the the density and the, the, something about fast te- like technical i guess not like tech death but you know like when i'm saying technical like hate eternal or nile yeah. or something yeah. like that. um that did something similar to me it was like they're really aggressive vocals you know like it was just this grating kind of like it was the musical version of the fuck you you know to yeah. me so I just got this. And like you said, I observed the same thing. It's like usually one or the other. You know, I felt like the really, really overwhelming and impressive and dazzling metal bands were missing a, an emotional quality that I that I liked in other genres and and vice versa. You know, the more emotional content I felt like subordinated the music because it was like, hey, this is about this is about the you know the message this isn't about the music why you gotta fucking choose yeah so have have both together have both together and have that connection on both sides of the um of the of the envelope yeah yeah exactly and 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 for me vitriol is always supposed to be an experience more than anything and i just want every every opportunity to inject aggression and and an emotional content into the music so that was always i was like man i don't want to and I also made myself that promise becoming a vocalist guitar player because I said, you're not going to start phoning one in over the other. If you start phoning one in over the other, you need to find either a full-time guitar player or vocalist because uh, you got to take that responsibility seriously. I wanted to make sure the quality of the band was no different as if I had a dedicated vocalist and a dedicated yeah. guitar player taking their respective jobs very, very seriously. So. Um, yeah, uh, I th- and I think that's the human element too. I mean, there's such an alienness about vitriol sound, which I love. It's kind of like you know, feels kind of not of this world. And I think the the really Im- expressive human voice grounds it and makes it feel. Uh, human i guess when you're obviously talking about having the you know having the music and the message together and and f- forefront what's the um basically what's the subject matter that people that are, that's within the lyrics on the new on the new record is there does it have a particular theme or is it um that, that it kind of that it covers or is it very determined on the on the tracks themselves it definitely has a theme it's um uh very strong theme i mean i've said you could it might qualify as a concept album but i don't like you know i don't i wouldn't you know market it as such but it is a it does tell a linear story from start to finish um each song uh flows conceptually and narratively into the next um and it's a much more introspective look than the first album the first album was more of a collage i guess you could say of a variety of of external observation and internal observation okay and i felt my interactions with the fans from the first album songs songs like uh victim and i drown nightly the more introspective my songs were the more i leaned into this voice of holding myself accountable and being vulnerable and investigating my own darknesses Mm -hmm. um the more the more valuable those connections with the fans were so it really helped me commit over the course of touring on that first record. I'm like, okay, this is where I want to go. You know, like this is where I'm getting the most value 
in terms of the 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 conversation I'm having with my fans. Uh, so with this next album, with Suffer and Become, I wanted to go all in on the introspection and not only the introspection, but try to be more vulnerable um, to try to ask more questions. You know, I've said a few times that To Bathe is a is an album full of answers and Suffer and Become is an album full of questions. Okay. You know, I'd say that's one of the biggest something a lot more humble about this album in that way where it's like a, a period of i don't want to say rest but a period of reflection where the first album is more of like an explosion of survival and it has to be arrogant and it has to not ask questions and it has to know exactly what the fuck it's doing and why and this album is more like there's a line there's a line in the album that says uh my hour of contempt is once again upon me. And that's, uh, that's this moment of, that hopefully people welcome periodically in their life where you interrogate all of your most cherished values. You know, even, uh, The lyrics in I Am Every Enemy uh, really um, summarize this idea well, this idea that uh, sorry, I have a hard, sometimes I have a hard time so keeping good. my thought tight well, and considering. <laughs> um, I won't ramble on too much longer. I'd say that <laughs> I'd say that the concept is trying to um, trying to overcome trying to overcome my personal and spiritual weaknesses is the theme of the new album. That kind of leads into another thing that I that I kind of got from it is that the second half's a lot. It it does it. There's a lot more anger in that second half than the first half. When you have that, um, when you have the um, the mid the middle track that's the the instrumental, um, is it survival's careering in inertia? If I'm pronouncing that, which I'm probably pronouncing incorrectly, as soon as as soon as that song finishes and and the, that second half comes in, it just it dials up. And it really just so it was like was that an intentional thing when you were putting it together? Or, or which obviously you've you've explained that now, but that was something I was quite interested in 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 finding out because it it does kind of it's already at this and then it just goes bang. Um well, I, I'm so so that makes me very happy that you picked up on that. Thank you for mentioning that. Uh you're the first person that has if, I'm sure you're the first, first person to notice, but you're the first person that has mentioned it to me that you you noticed that. And that was very, very intentional. Um, uh, with this record, knowing it had a linear story, uh, I really wanted to go all in on the, on the album experience. Yeah. I like to call it, you know, especially in an age that age of singles, yeah. the age of EPs, the age of, you know, which I'm fine with, you know, I'm all about the the way evolving the way we consume music you know uh, but with that being said uh i'm a huge fan of the medium of the album yeah you know and so i wanted this to kind of be a love letter to the long play you know um and in order to do that i wanted to feel i knew i put as much effort into sculpting the shape of the album as i did it, each individual song i wanted the if i stripped the vocals off of the album i'd want it to be able to tell a similar story musically you know um and that is the launching off point so like survival's careening inertia is is when the plane starts nosediving 
Yeah. You know what I mean? And you could, you, obviously it's very heavy handed at the end of that song that we're descending into the descending the rings of hell, you know, by the end of that song. And then when weaponized loss comes in, you know, you've arrived. So I wanted that to be this like act two, almost yeah. you're, you're the villain arc, you know, <laughs> <laughs> You know, your bad you know, your bad guy phase or whatever. Uh and and then hopefully the album ends with a little bit of uh humility and optimism, you know, but uh it's really autobiographical, you know, and so that's the period the period of my life that that's on the later half of that album. Uh it's definitely the angrier half. Yeah. Um on to, on to touring, because obviously, as we've discussed, the um, you know your last European, well, planned European tour that was meant to be Crisian and Gruesome didn't happen. Um, I know there's some stuff in the States that's um, in place already, and you have been touring throughout the um, last, few, last few years. Are there plans to come over to Europe at, um, in, the coming, in the coming months um, to tour the record? I am... Very, very desperate to make it to Europe before the end of the year. Not the coming months. Um, we have our first tour uh, out since the album has been released will be Chaos and Carnage, which is a U.S. tour um, featuring seven bands. So let's see if I can pull this out. Cattle Decapitation, Carnifex, The Zenith Passage, Humanity's Last Breath, Rivers of Nile, Us, and a band called Face Yourself. Okay. Um, that's going to be wild. It's going to probably, you know, that's definitely the biggest commercially speaking tour we will have done yet. Yep. And then after that, uh, in the summer, we're hoping to do our first headlining tour, okay. uh, which is very exciting. And then by the end, before the year is over, I'd really love to make it over there to Europe, but uh, no, no guarantees. The manager and booking agent said they'll see what's possible but yeah. i took a really long time finishing this record and that kind of messed up our our planning schedule yeah <laughs> sorry guys that's <laughs> i mean obviously you've, you've mentioned that, uh, that obviously you've got your first headline your potentially first headline tour coming up and when you've been on tour you've toured with some um obviously some very very large acts when you th i think the first european tour was with nile and hate eternal am i right in that now, yeah when you're on a tour like that and you've obviously got you're touring with bands who've got a very dedicated fan base, what do you think's the biggest key in winning them over when you guys hit the stage? Ooh. Or is the one? Or is it just you just have to do what you do? I think that's it, man. I mean, I think you gotta like a big thing is be smart about who you tour with. Yeah. I mean, a lot of like that's the best advice I can give it. And that's the hardest thing. You know, it's harder than getting good opportunities. It's turning down good opportunities. That's really hard, you know, especially when people on your team are encouraging you to do so. Yeah. But in the early days of vitriol, I had to make some really hard calls, you know, about turning down some uh, tour offers with bands that have, a larger fan base, yep. a fan base that I don't think um, <sighs> fan base that I don't think overlaps with the fan base that vitriol has already cultivated. So it's, you know, you got to be strategic um, and it's developing, cultivating a fan base, cultivating your, your image, when I say image, I don't mean like how people see your band, the relationship that they have with like the attitude of your band uh, has a lot to do with how you're framed on these tours, surprisingly. So um, I was very mindful of touring with bands that, let me put it this way, is an easier way of answering your question. Um, 
a, a big part of the mission statement with vitriol is to take the fire and the fury from the late 90s early 2000s death metal that, that i love and put it into a contemporary sound with all the bells and whistles and all the modern bpms and technicality so what i wanted to do is get in front of the fans that loved the fire of the old shit and they probably think nothing new is that angry yeah right so those were the fans i wanted to get in front of okay uh and so that's why we toured with bands like vader and nile and you know dying fetus and i christian was the hope you know these bands that that um huge christian fan um these bands that had carry that flame uh but you know uh sonically might be not as you know modern i guess yeah. sorry i'm trying they, to they, they have they have that rage within them but they're but they're not Again, they're, they're, they've got the they've got the the rage and the sound and the way that they they play and that they vocally perform, but they've obviously you know they've kind of crafted their sound from from the time basically at the time that they they came out, and you guys yes. wanted to do the same thing but with the, with the modern with with how things are perceived now in, in the modern um, in the modern style of a genre. Exactly. Yeah, I don't want to say they're not like pushing because they they were in their time in the same way that when when vitriol's been around for 20 years the new yeah. bands are going to sound newer than us but we're not going to stop trying so it's yeah. like it's just you know we're just trying to carry the torch so to speak you okay. know i wanted to bring i wanted to bring that fire that i love to my generation yeah and hopefully bring it back for the earlier generation that lost kind of lost their passion for the music and that's been one of the most rewarding things for the band is like for from my experience in the band is getting like old heads to get excited about death metal again you know yeah. dudes are like i haven't heard a band in 20 fucking years that stokes me out you know so okay. that's that's the ultimate compliment cool um i mean i've kind of kind of covered everything that i had down is there anything that you just want to kind of uh, basically say before we before we sign off at all oh man um yeah um listen to a record come see us on tour <laughs> <laughs> awesome my hard sales pitch yeah but thank you very much um for taking the time out and um yeah hopefully um by the end of the year you'll be over here and if not early into the um into the following one yeah absolutely that's the hope thank you for the time and the opportunity and bearing with me with my long run on answers uh, appreciate of you know appreciate the delve into into basically what makes um what makes vitriol tick thank you thank you very much thanks for listening make sure you keep up to date with all of our interviews by subscribing to our channel for all the latest news reviews interviews and more head over to our website www.therazorsedge.rocks